this morning. We have some back from vacation and some on vacation. We're glad that you're here. In Brother Charlie Nero's talk on Wednesday night, he made a comment that I think is good for us to think about for a while. And that is in his expressing his appreciation for being able to stand and speak, that he wished there were more people who could be doing the same thing. Well, I take a double view of that. Of course, he wouldn't want anybody teaching that didn't know what they were talking about or if they were teaching false doctrine. But teaching implies that you know something, and knowing it means you've studied it. And you can't teach what you don't know. And throughout the Old and New Testaments, we're taught one way or the other, one extent or the other, to study, to study, to study. We're most familiar with Paul's statement to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right to divide and work truth. I'd like to focus for a moment on the word study as it's used there. We think of study and picking up a book or something like this and reading the words to come to understanding that we didn't have through what's in those words or something to that effect. Actually, what is being said by Paul, and it's seen in the American Standard Version, is to give diligence. It really is more accurately saying, be studious. Be somebody that's anxious to learn and willing to do what's necessary to learn. Each individual knows what it takes for him or her to get something in their mind. Some people learn faster than other people. Some people can go at it in spurts, and some people can stay a long time at it. But you don't have in your head what you do not study. So to be a good teacher, you're going to have to be a good student. And when you read the Bible, you see it has a lot to say about false teachers. Well, the people being taught are expected then to be studying too so they can follow what is said by the teacher. Paul was very concerned about living what he taught others to do. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, he said, but I keep under my body, I bust it my body, bring it into subjection, lest that by any means After I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. If there's any verse in Old or New Testaments that says a teacher must be exceedingly serious about his teaching and even more so about him living as he teaches others to live. Now we many times will be focused in on the preacher in the pulpit when we think about a sermon like this. But we owe so much to the teachers who teach at the very, in the various classes. Because they fit the same thing. They have to be very studious. They can't teach what they don't know. Thus, they must study. And especially when you go down to the younger children, it is exceedingly difficult to get over a few things to those children according to their several abilities at that stage to learn. And those teachers put in so many hours outside of the class to be able to do that. I don't think that I would make a very good teacher at the younger grades or even before they get to the grades. I think that's one we reason that women do so much better job. There's that motherly instinct in them and something that God never gave the man necessarily. Not that men can't do things. I'm just saying that the role of teaching at that level seems to fit more the feminine disposition attitude of mind. But whatever the case may be, whether you're trying to teach a two-year-old, a second grader, a fourth grader, or whatever. You cannot teach what you do not know. And if you are going to teach it, 
then you must be willing to live it rather than do as you please and expect other people to do only as you taught them. Jesus got into it regularly with the Pharisees because they would bind heavy burdens by their teaching on others, saying this is what you must do, but yet they didn't attempt at all to abide by their teaching. So certainly we would be hypocrites if we taught but then did not live according to our teaching no matter how well we taught the truth Paul was concerned about that I don't know how you can read 1 Corinthians 9 27 and not see that he was trying to get that very point across to his readers this is how I live before God and if such a great servant of the Lord God Almighty as the Apostle Paul had that disposition of heart then we understand why he was so great and how we should emulate him now with that in mind, I want us to look at James 3 and verse 1. James 3 and verse 1. James is writing to Jewish Christians. That's their background. They've heard the gospel, believed it, obeyed it. And much of what he has in the book of James is very practical. It gets right down to where people live on a day-to-day -day basis. But we mentioned in the beginning that while we would like to see people teaching, more people teaching, more preachers preaching, you can't teach what you don't know and you must be taught right. Are you liable to teach something that's wrong? And James addresses this in this first verse. Be not many of you teachers, my brethren, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. American Standard says, knowing we'll receive the heavier judgment. Now, I know that it was not the purpose of the Holy Spirit nor James to discourage a qualified teacher from teaching God's Word at every opportunity and place it would be conducive for doing the same. Indeed, Jesus said that all should be taught of God, John 6, 44 and 45. And it takes a goodly number of members of the church to prepare to be able to teach in order that all can be taught of God. The gospel is to be preached to every creature. Now, if people are taught, then you see then it implies that they must be teachers. In fact, both the need to be taught and the need to be teachers are set out in Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14. And it's interesting that it's set out there in the process of the writer rebuking those people for not having progressed in their studies and in their application of what they had studied. And because of that, they were slip sliding away from the faith. They were not able to bear up under persecution for their faith. We read that he says, however, there's been a temptation to some to teach, emphasize that, who desiring to be teachers of the law, they understand neither what they say, nor where are they confidently affirmed. First Timothy 1.7. The point being that since we know that the Bible says members of the church ought to be faithful in life and in what they teach and they must study to know so they have the wherewithal to teach, there is still the other side of the coin. And Paul addresses that here as the writer of Hebrews addressed it to those who had time to be teachers, but they hadn't used it to learn, so they had to go back to the beginning themselves. But here he said there are some who desire. They desire to be. And what is it they desire to be? They desire to be teachers of the law. But then he says this about them. They understand neither what they say nor whereof they confidently affirm. Does that begin to tell you that some people like the prominence that goes along with being the preacher or a teacher rather than what a teacher or preacher ought to be doing? A true faithful child of God who teaches studies hard because that's the way he comes to know. 
And he does it for his own good so he can live like the Lord wants him to live. But then he does it so he can reach others with the gospel. To teach them the way of righteousness. To cause them to understand God's will concerning how to obtain forgiveness of sins and how to live a faithful Christian life. But these desire to be teachers, but look at their understanding. What he's saying is they desire the prominence. You remember Jesus dealt with that when he some said some desire to be called rabbi. That is, there was a prominence to it. It was a chief seat position. They liked the acclaim. The vainglory of life touched them here. So, Paul warns Timothy, who himself is a teacher, is a preacher of the gospel. You're going to run across these people. What kind of people? You're going to run across people who desire to be teachers of the law. But what about them? They have the desire, but they understand neither what they say nor whereof they confidently affirm. Being a preacher as long as I have, and sometimes especially when I'm watching some of these television preachers, I wonder, I stand amazed at the profound and abysmal ignorance of people. And when you begin to see so many of them are following, the view is, send me your money, all of it, immediately. That's what you're supposed to do. Because that's being faithful on your part. And if you don't do it, you won't be what you ought to be. Well, I wonder who they give their money to. Now, does that mitigate against what the Bible teaches on us being servants and contributing of our means? It has a great deal to say about that. No. It doesn't. What it says is you can be wrong in those areas. We want people to be converted to Christ. And if they're truly converted to Christ, then they're going to have to be taught the truth of God. There's a lot that's passing as people who are converted to Christ today. But when you talk to them and you study what the Bible says with them, if you can get them to do that, you realize they don't understand anything about the fundamentals of the gospel of Christ. They've listened to this one, that one, and the other one. Rarely have they taken time to sit down and genuinely study the word of God. They haven't even taken the time to understand what it means to handle a right or rightly divide the word of truth. They're just as apt to go over to the book of Leviticus and the Old Testament to look for the answer to the question of what must I do to be saved from my sins as they are to go to the book of Acts. They don't know the right division of the word. And I promise you, if you don't know the right division of the word, you're not going to understand what you ought to be and you have no business teaching people. So people who are going to be teachers should be qualified, shouldn't they? Well, certainly. You need to know what a teacher believes because he's going to teach what he or she believes. Thus, we are concerned, as we should be, and I say we, Christians, preachers, wherever you may be in the church, if the church is what the New Testament says it should be, about who is teaching. That's the reason that I congratulate, encourage, exhort the teachers we now have. Somebody, someday somebody's got to take their place. Now, are you qualifying for that? Are you working hard at it? First of all, by being a Christian woman or man, wife or husband mother or father living it out in your life showing by your example that you know the truth and you're applying it to your life those things are very important next of all and it's sometimes hard because of what I just said is to be able to give teachers a little relief from time to time <laughs> that's hard because so many times we don't have enough teachers to where there can be a rotation in and out. People need a break sometimes, be refreshing themselves. But here's the, as the fellow said one time, the mainest thing <laughs> that I want to get over. And that is to be a teacher, you must know and you must live according to what you know and you can't know it if you don't study yourself. And that's what James is talking about when he says, 
don't be many masters or teachers, my brethren, knowing that we shall receive the heavier judgment of the greater condemnation. It's a most serious matter for a man to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. For woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16. So a heavy responsibility is on the shoulders of any teacher of truth. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Take heed to thyself. There again, there's where it begins. And when Paul addressed the Ephesian elders, that's how he began with them. You take heed to yourself. Then to the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So take heed to thyself, Timothy, and thy teaching. Continue in these things. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy 4.16 a vital requirement for a teacher then is unquestionable soundness in the faith. A complete grasp of the fundamentals of the gospel and the first principles of the oracles of God. Knowing what the Lord's church really is and the plan of salvation, its work and its worship. Knowing the difference in the Lord's church and human churches. Having a faith that stands based solely on the word of God. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. A person who like Paul says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Well, to walk by faith and not by sight. Since faith comes by hearing the word of God. Means to walk as the word of God authorizes us to walk. To live as the word of God leads and guides and directs us. Before a person teaches, they ought to have that kind of life because they know the truth. It's personal to them. They want to serve God. They know the seriousness of wearing that name Christian, which means of Christ. They're concerned about being faithful, and they're concerned about the faithfulness of their brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice what we have Paul's char in Paul's charge to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4. As I exhorted thee to tarry at Ephesus when I was going into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge certain men not to teach a different doctrine, neither to give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questionings, rather than a dispensation of God which is in faith, so do I now. American Standard Version, 1901. Again, when we put these together, and there are many more we can put with them, do you see how concerned the Apostle Paul was that the truth and all of its purity be taught and defended? Nothing added to it, subtracted from it, that nothing was altered at all, and that people would be convicted of the truth and be willing to defend it. A false teacher can disrupt a congregation. That's what they do. <laughs> It's amazing to me to see folks take their Bibles, the Word of God, and they study it. And then they hear somebody teach contrary to it, and they just can't believe what they're hearing. Or else this is a long time somebody they've known. And, of course, if you've known somebody a long time, they've been good friends to you. They can never teach a false doctrine. Which, of course, is silly on the very face of it. We can never have associations with mortals. So trusting in them that we don't have to pay attention to what they say and what they do. I don't care whether they're your wife, husband, father, mother, son, or daughter. They're human beings. Thus, we must be concerned about what they teach and how they live. And if we're to be the teachers God wants in the church, then we've got to be concerned about the teachers in that line too. These people like this are giving their attention to spurious speculations, false doctrines. They have no place in the teaching of the church. In fact, they need to be correctively disciplined that they might be sound in the faith. Let me emphasize again what I've been emphasizing one way or another all the way through. I don't think I can overly emphasize it. 
A teacher must be studious. If anyone should study the Bible, it is the person who teach. Again, this is emphasized in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. And notice the approval you're seeking, that is the student is seeking, is the approval of God. Study to show thyself approved of God. A workman, you're putting to practice in your daily life what you studied. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Ashamed before whom? God. The person who studies the Word of God and lives the Word of God and teaches the Word of God has nothing to be ashamed of when they stand before God. That's the point being made. And every one of us should have that view as faithful Christians, but especially those who want to convey the truth of God to others or to teach them. All hearers should imitate the noble Bereans. Now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Well, why were they? In that they received the word with all readiness of mind, examining the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Acts 17, 11. Remember, it was Paul who told the young preacher of Timothy to give heed to reading, 1 Timothy 4, 13. Do you realize that reading is something that is, is fading away? People don't read much of anything anymore. Well, there's one little thing they hold in their hand. They read that kind of language is there, which is about as in-depth as a flea. We don't read. When I grew up in Camden, Arkansas, International Paper Company had one of its mills there, and that's where my father worked for 35 years. International Paper Company's motto is to this day, give me a man who reads. Can you guess why? If you can read and understand what you're reading, the world opens wide open to you. You can grasp many things. I can't encourage a person to read too much. And of course he's talking about the word of God here. A teacher must know his Bible. That's just all there is to it. A teacher should be an example in all things. A pattern. One who does not practice what he teaches invariably is a hindrance and a hurt. Timothy was expected to be an example of the believer. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. And it was to the church in Rome that Paul wrote, Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Romans 2.21 It's certain that the teacher who's unfaithful cannot effectively teach others. A worldly, ungodly member needs to be taught rather than attempting to teach others. So when James says, Be ye not many masters or teachers, my brethren. And then he said, knowing that we shall receive the heavier judgment or greater condemnation, that should make every teacher tremble somewhat because it shows you the importance of being a faithful teacher. God's going to hold you accountable more than he is other people because what you teach determines what people hear. And if you teach wrongly, they can't be taught rightly by wrong teaching. The consequences of teaching that which is false are very serious. Jesus said concerning false teachers of his day, let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind guide the blind, the blind lead the blind, there's only one destination. They'll all fall into the ditch or the pit. And he's talking about teachers there. Don't know what they're talking about. Matthew 15, 14. And remember what I said earlier. Paul felt compelled to be telling other people's, people the truth. Remember, remember Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So Paul said, woe is unto me. If I preach not the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. So you see, you can be a false teacher even when you don't intend to be because 
you're really not studied well enough on the subject and you end up teaching what you think is right. But really it's wrong. So every day teachers need to be cautious. They need to be checking up on themselves. They need to spend much time in studying the scriptures, learning how the Bible authorizes, warning to ascertain the authority of their Lord as it's presented in the Bible. Notice, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. Jesus said, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. You know, if there's nothing else, that should encourage everyone in the church to study more, and especially the teachers. This Bible that you have, or Bibles you have at home, especially we're talking about the New Testament now, because that's how Christ exercises his authority on earth. It's going to face us at the judgment, and we're going to face it, and it'll mean then just what it means now. So should we want to study the standard by which we will be judged? God's already given it to us. For our own good. It's the only book that can lead us to heaven. Us, if we teach it, then we're trying to teach people how to go to heaven. It's not worth too much to live life on earth and go to hell. And God doesn't want that. Why does he not send his son back now? Well, Peter tells us the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. But he's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. So as we've studied today about the importance of being teachers and the kind of teachers that we must have and what it takes to have them, and it takes individual responsibility of every brother and sister in Christ to prepare themselves, then I hope that it will make us appreciate the good teachers we have and strive to be better teachers and to prepare ourselves to teach because those teachers won't be here forever. Somebody must take their place. Now you're qualifying yourself to do that. If you're not a child of God today, then as we close the lesson, we want to give you the opportunity to become a Christian. You do this by believing in Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, repenting of your sins, Acts 17.30, confessing your faith in the Christ, Romans 10.10, 10, and being buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. More than that, He doesn't enjoin upon you. Less than that, you cannot become a Christian. If you'll obey the gospel and be baptized of the Lord, He'll forgive you your sins and add you to His church. You see, you have to be taught the plan of salvation to understand what God requires of you to become a Christian, to be saved from your sins. Even as you must be taught everything else about the church and its organization, work and worship, and how to live individually the Christian life. Now, as a Christian, if you've wandered from the Lord, if you haven't been living like you know the Bible teaches, then we urge you as you search your heart, and God does too, who knows all things, to repent of your sins and His second law of pardon for the child of God. Confess those sins and pray God to forgiveness. If you're subject then to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.